Um, it's actually interesting, just as you were as you were talking through there. Uh, thanks, Kieran, as well for for asking me here. It's a, it's a it's a tricky one because usually when you're asked to do something like this, you're asked to talk about things like motivation and stuff like that. But this one was well, stretching it a bit further to think maybe a bit more deeply because you can do the motivation one in your sleep. Uh, at this stage, because it's 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 I suppose it's common enough things that maybe people would, would know about. But one of the interesting pieces, and it it, it, um, it comes back to the, the, the communication part. But just as as Kieran was talking there, it struck me about one of, one of the things that we we're all faced with challenges, and it's interesting that you're faced with the same one in work and in um, and in business. Well, I certainly was. Was that we're dealing with. Um, big intergenerational issues when it comes to areas like this and there's a lot of studies going on at the moment about how big this effect is actually on people and on teams and they have they've I mean, you can you can google this there's loads of information about it but there's generation x generation y generation z and then there's baby boomers and and there's people behind that are veterans but but in the workforce this is probably what we're going to encounter so this is people born after 1945 and before 65, and this is 65 to 78, and this is 78 to 2000, and we probably don't have too many of these in the workforce, which is after 2000. But the interesting piece about that from a communications point of view is that all of these would have a preference for different types of communication. So, so certainly, you know, more formal uh, letters, etc., would, would be quite important in here. A little bit of technology, but not too much in here, and technology only in here. And God only knows what this is. Three forms of technology uh, coming at them, and, and just this, this is very early days. But they say these Z generation people are the best multitaskers of all. They can they can actually look at an iPad, a phone, give out to you, and watch the telly at the same time. And, and they're showing that they actually are. They're defying some of the preconceived notions about multitasking. But what's interesting is. On the football scale of things, we had this, so we had management, people in management who were in this category, we had people in management who were in this category, and we had players in this category mainly. So we were dealing with a communication issue that was fairly complex. So, so we came from, if you like, down here where you might have heard about the match by word of mouth from somebody, to up here where they expected to get a text message, and they also expected to have an online forum that they could communicate with each other. And Stuck in the middle there, we kind of half knew a little bit about both ends of it and really weren't sure. But what it did tell us was one size didn't fit all. Because sending a tweet to Mickey Wheeler to tell him there was training session wasn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, so it was interesting. And we encountered the same things in, in work as well um, in relation to, to those challenges. So I'll, co I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, but w one of the things that I... I would have discovered it in, in both scenarios is the importance of having some sort of structure or system if you want to make something happen. And one that we use quite a lot and I still use quite a lot in, in work is a very, very simple structure which says, okay, can we be clear before we enter something, can we be clear what are the kind of results that we're going to try to achieve here? And, and very often in my experience, that's in the past in companies I've worked in, and in football teams are working, that's all we ever did. We talked about the results and we said, you know, let's go out and get that result. That's it. And like we got very motivated for it, but we maybe left it at that and you come back and you find no, we didn't achieve that result. And then you say, the following year, let's try to achieve that result again, and you still don't get it. But I think being stuck at that level alone is not enough. You need to break it down and say, okay, what actually do you need to do to achieve the results? So, so get into the meat of what is required in order for that result to happen. So if that result was winning in All-Ireland, that on its own wasn't enough in terms of players. You know they were in that room or they were wherever to achieve winning in All-Ireland. But, so I'll just give the example, winning in All-Ireland. But in order to do that, we knew that there were certain characteristics that would, if you did them, and you could say, well, sure, if you score more than the opposition, grand. That's wonderful, but it's not really going to take because they're, they're also results. So, so if you could build up what were the performance criteria or the things that teams did to win, and we got the players at one point in time to analyse the two previous All-Ireland winning matches and see could they come up with patterns of things that they noticed. And we did. We, we actually found that there were three things at that time, and I'm, I'm sure these changed because they're, they're, they're due with the trends in, in the sport at the time. But if a team won the tackle count, 
So the number of times in, in, in tackling was the number of times that they turned the player around, stopped him going the direction he was going. If they won kickouts, and by kickouts I mean that they actually win the primary possession and then get it over the opposition's 45. Okay, so, so that was a one kick out where you won it and you actually managed to get it over, the, not tech, turned over in the middle. And the last one was, what was the last one now? It was two years ago. Uh, the last one was uh, the amount of times you got inside the opposition's 45. So, the, so not just from kickouts, but just if you turned them over and you got in there. So if you won all three of those battles in terms of a match, or in terms of the All-Ireland Finals, the previous two winners, they were the characteristics. And amazingly for us, when for the three years where we were starting to track this, every time we won all three of those, we won the game. And only once where we won all three, we drew a game. And every time we lost, we lost those as well. And in fact, the scary thing was, that one alone also carried through for all of that. So any time we won the tackle count, we won a game. Which, I, you know, there's... That was, I wouldn't say that was the case this year. I'd say, I'd say it was a slightly different thing, but that was the, the trend at the time. So, breaking it down into the, the two piece, very important, but there's another part here, which is being able to, it was well enough defining that and saying, yeah, that's what we need to do in order to achieve this result, but actually are you able to do it? And so the only evidence, when we, when we had done this breakdown after 2009 with Dublin, uh, we discovered that actually our tackle count was maybe 15% of what the top teams were doing. So the top teams were doing around 100, we were doing 15 on average a game. So, and actually, we, 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 players said, oh yeah, I know how to tackle, but we said, well, we've no evidence that we know, so we better do a lot of work on that. So, also over here is, it being able to, you must have the resources to do it. So, it's well enough to find training, but it had to also suit the things that the players wanted. So, in there we had to have all the communication tools and all of the stuff that we needed as well as do all the training and then the last leg of this of this model was you had to want to and again i don't intend to go into that box but i mean you could stick over there motivation as being a, a key that that is what that is all about and for a lot of people i suppose that generally in sport is actually being ticked. They really do want to be there at elite sport. Maybe on, on lesser teams it's not. But where the performance usually falls down is somewhere there. If people don't know what it is they're supposed to do, then they generally get stuck and won't do it. Or if they know what to do and they're not able to do it, then they, they're not going to do it. So, so your real performance or achieving the results comes about getting these two right. And then generally speaking, this one, this one will be okay. But above that then also, if you, if you take it a work context, Achieving results, there must be some sort of purpose associated with that. You know, it, it, if, it can't be just in isolation. So in sport, it's fairly straightforward, all right. But there probably is a bigger purpose to Dublin winning All Ireland. It's probably for the greater benefit of the GEA that Dublin are successful the odd time. Not every year, but <laughs> we'd be happy with every year. But for the GEA in general, it probably is a good thing. And the way it's done is probably a good thing as well. If, it, if it's done in a very sporting way, there's a bigger purpose at play. But it's the same with any system. So, so this is a, a, is a model we use, and so you have a system in play. But if I think back to, and I'm going on to the next sort of area, if you think back to, if somebody comes to you and says, now look, there's the system, right? You need to do 10 tackles in the game, you need to do this, you need to do that, now you go and do it. And you go, yeah, right. I don't believe that, I don't believe in tackling. So, so there's a part where we we'll all want this sense of a say in what is the system. And if, if you impose it, or particularly going back to that generation, if you even try to impose that on X or Y, they go, yeah, I'll do that. And then they go out and they go do whatever they think is the right thing to do. So, so a big part of getting a system to work, I believe, is getting early engagement. So what I talked about with the Dublin players, if you notice, I said we didn't analyze it. They analyzed it. And they came up. And they spent hours and hours looking at video of finals, trying to figure out what, you now we knew. We had, we, had, we had analysts who had done this and they had spent hours and hours doing it, but we let the players try and find it. And they were tearing their hair out, but when they made the breakthrough, there was no convincing them that this was a good idea to do it. They just then said, right, what does it take for me to tackle? So if, when we broke it down and said, well, you need to go to the gym and do this, a hundred times, they just went to the gym and did it a hundred times. Because there was no arguing over it, because the engagement was there. But a big part of that engagement 
was about getting the detail about what this meant. So, so if I go and I'll just give you the, the sporting analogy first. If you go and, and, and you say to players, mark your man, you know, I would have thought in 2009 was on it, that, that's a fairly standard concept that people would know. And after 2009, obviously after a catastrophe, we asked the backs that, and we got five different answers. So we said, we gave them the scenario that there's the goal, that's your man, the ball is over there, what would you mark? And some said, I'd mark here, behind them, goal side. Some said, I'd mark the other side, but behind them. Others said, they'd mark in front. And it became very clear that, they, that marking your man wasn't common language. They didn't have a common understanding of what that meant. So they clarified it and eventually said, who's the best at marking? And said, it's Rory and Carl. So what does he do? Well, actually, I stand between the man and the ball. At the county level, and I keep a hold of my man. Right? That became touch type marking in their world. And then they had a common understanding. So if you were the full back or the midfielder and the end back there, that's what you did. And at least all the others knew that's what you were doing. So this clarity around language, for instance, if you were trying to roll out in a, in a scheme and the employee said, let's communicate this to everyone. Well, to the guy who's Y generation, for instance, he's going to be thinking there'll be a blog, there'll be a website, there'll be a tweet. And the guy who's a baby boomer or an X generation will think, yes, we'll have a formal roadshow here, that we'll have presentations, and then we get a letter, and then we get to consider the letter. So, so communicate is an abstract word when you're trying to deal with rolling out a system like this, because what it means to you and what it means to me is completely different. And unbundling that in terms of real engagement is key. So unbundling what people mean by their words, so that if you had a group together and you're trying to do something that's going to be a rollout, it's really important that you get a common understanding. You know, the common understanding might be that all the communication is different, that we need to have the three format, we need to have a multimedia format because one size won't fit all. So, if you did get that engagement, and a big part of that is somebody leading it, who, in order to do the unbundling, is asking the questions. So, it's been the pain saying, so what do you mean exactly by that? What do you mean by communicate? By what you, was that your understanding of communicate? No, actually, I thought it'd be a letter. And you captured them all, and you're, you're, what you're not saying is, because this is where this goes really wrong, is to say, Connor, what's your, your view of communication? If I'm, if I'm facilitating something like this and I say to you, what, what, what would your view of communicate be? Yeah. You're wrong, you're wrong. Right, next, anyone else got a view? And then everyone will shut up. They won't say a word. So if you actually get it out and say, right, there's, there's the 20. Now, can we do all of them? No, we can't. Right, how many of them could we do? Okay, well, let's do something for each generation or each part of our audience. Now, you happen to be Google or somebody, you probably only need to look after the why. But it's important that it is adaptable. And that's, I think there's that expectation, particularly from younger people, to get that say, but also to get that clarity that, you know, they will be very happy to cater for everyone. So that's a little bit about engagement and maybe a system. And again, that's all well and good. And you say, you have that in place, you have the blocks in place, then it has to happen. You know, the, the thing has to work. So, in order for something to work, and I, I, I would really, really believe in this, is that this piece about empowering is really important. And again, empowering is an abstraction, so it's probably good to unbundle what, what would that mean. And in, in my experience, and I'm working with teams in a work situation and also in a sporting situation, that empowerment means they have the ability to choose. They have the ability to make decisions. And now, some people at this point in time are saying, free for all. Okay? Because that's, that would be potentially where you think this is going. But people, and, and when you talk to teams and ask about this, they'll also say, but we respect the boundaries. <coughs> so, we want to have the ability to choose. We do want to have the ability to make a decision, but we will it, it, it respect the fact that there are boundaries. And what are the boundaries? Well, well, the boundaries are possibly the system that they've designed. And if they've designed it, they can't really argue with it as being a boundary. So, so when it comes to implementing something that, that is a change, I really believe the more 
you can do the upfront engagement with people who are going to be part of the system, or and you could you could call this co-design the, the, the solution, the more likely you are to get that they will feel empowered. It's very hard to feel empowered when someone comes to you and says, there's the system, now you're free to do what you like. Because you say, well, I don't agree with 10 of the things in the system. Whereas if I've actually been involved in the engagement process, and I didn't agree with 10 of the things in the system, at least I'll have had the process to say, right, well, the collective was that view, I, I, I was heard, wasn't listened to, but I'm much more likely to go with being in power and stay with the plan. You'll have the odd person who will still say, well, you know, I had, a, I had a better idea and I told you so, but it's not working. But I think this is certainly for X and Y generation, being empowered is very important. But actually, also for baby boomers, they want to be empowered. They really want to have a sense of, of control over what is going to happen. And a lot of that control in this space that, that you're talking about today is being eroded by things that are happening in the market. And actually having a sense of getting more of that control back, I think, I mean, when I'm listening to you today, there's even more we can certainly do within Dalkia about people, like we would have people who had, in the UK, who had defined benefits, so we have a very small number who still have them, and then we have younger people who are coming into the business, and they don't know what they want, but they want something, and I think actually engaging with them to design the future system, and taking account of some baby boomers who have the defined benefit, who don't, some don't have it, who also want to start to get control over their destiny. I think there's a lot that is an expectation that there that doesn't rise to the top. It's not the number one thing that your employees are telling you every day, but it is maybe a differentiator that we can bring if you have something that's very flexible that would encourage people to stay. That's if you want them to stay. Anyway, I hope, I hope that was of, of, of some benefit in terms of just a little piece about systems, engagement and empowerment, because I, I, I would firmly believe that it is the right way about going. You get things done doing other things, but I think you're more likely to get a higher output if you do do that. It takes more time up front, but you spend less time down the line. Okay? Thanks, Matt. Thanks a minute.